All right, thanks for coming back with us again. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, so I just want to talk about two years ago, you were with us on uh, at TechCrunch Disrupt, and it was all about CRISPRing animals, but you've since moved on to CRISPRing humans. Why is that? Yeah, so I, I think like many startup companies, we've gone through a couple of different versions and pivots as we ultimately figure out the best way we can use gene editing to make an impact on our communities. Um, so when we first founded the company, it was really a broad platform technology play. We actually weren't working on developing any of our own products and instead partnered with other companies like a livestock company who's working on solving animal health and well-being issues. Uh, but over the years, as we've developed better versions of CRISPR and have really advanced the ball in terms of the technology, we realized it was the right time to make a bet ourselves and actually invest in developing our own products. And so today we're taking all the capabilities that we've built over the past many years and we're developing new cancer therapies using CRISPR gene editing. Okay, and it also probably helped that the patent was cleared up a little bit to go into human editing, right? Well, at, at this point, a lot of that is, is still ongoing. Um, there's still what's called an interference proceeding happening between the University of California and their collaborators, the Broad Institute and their collaborators. So this, this is a story that will keep being told over years to come. All right, well, um, so I do want to get into what you're actually doing right now. And that has to do with uh, CAR T cells. Can you explain how CRISPR works with CAR T cells and what that is and what it all means? Sure. So maybe I'll start with what is a CAR T cell. Um, so CAR T is a pretty new technology. There are only two approved products here in the United States where doctors are actually able to take a cancer patient's own T cells. These are specialized immune cells. Take them into the laboratory and give them a little thing called a CAR, which is basically a molecule that can specifically recognize a, a protein sitting on the outside of cancer cells. So it's basically a way to engineer the immune system to find and fight cancer. But today, these CAR-T products are patient-specific. Physicians actually have to take T cells from the sick individual, make a product just for them, and deliver it back to them. It's very expensive, it's time consuming. Some of these people are so ill, they actually don't even live long enough for their product to be made and delivered to them. And so gene editing holds incredible potential for this field. Instead of having to take a patient's own cells, we can now go to healthy donors, healthy people and healthy T cells, and use gene editing to make enough changes that we can make what's called an off-the-shelf product. And really, one of the critical changes is making sure that you don't cause graft-versus-host disease, right? If you would just take an organ from you and give it to me, my body would reject it. It would know that it's, it's not me, and it would use the immune system to try to kill off that organ, even if it's trying to save my life. So we can use gene editing to basically trick these things to make it no longer look like it's foreign, so that they can survive long enough in the cancer patient to find and fight the cancer. And, and so just to clear that up, you're basically saying that you can mass produce medicine for cancer patients no matter what kind of a cancer they have. So it, it's all very specific to not only certain kinds of cancer, but what proteins sit on the outside of that cancer. Um, so for example, the first program that we're working on is to treat certain kinds of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And many of those have a little protein that sits on the outside of the cancer cell called CD19. And so our product is able to specifically recognize that protein and kill the cancer cells that have it on the outside. So to go after a different kind of cancer, we'd have to re-engineer a new product to recognize a new protein for that kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll get into anything beyond cancer like Alzheimer's disease? It's a great question. At Caribou, we're laser focused on cancer today, but if you look at the broader gene editing field, people are doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, people are trying to advance therapies for various genetic disorders, um, and I'm aware of some research projects on Huntington's right now as well. Okay. Uh, is there uh, any company specifically you can mention or 
um, anyone that's working on something sure. you think is kind of interesting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the other companies in our space is aptly named CRISPR Therapeutics, and they're advancing um, using CRISPR to try to treat beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, which are both uh, disorders of the blood system. And I think it holds quite a lot of promise and potential. It's kind of a small community, right? Like uh, you're talking about CRISPR therapeutics, which was co-founded by the same woman who helped co-create the CRISPR-Cas9 system along with Jennifer Doudna, who that's right. is your co-founder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so I think that's kind of interesting how it's just, it's a lot of women and it's a very small space. It's pretty cool, absolutely. And of the, the four original CRISPR companies, um, two of them are led by women, which I think is remarkable. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. Um, there is a lot of confusion around CRISPR and there is some fear that we're playing God by editing our genes. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think they're really important ethical and moral questions that have to be asked as part of figuring out where to use the technology and probably more importantly, where not to use the technology. Um, at Caribou, we actually have a company policy, no human embryo editing, full stop. No baby embryo, yeah, embryo editing. Correct, yeah. correct. So no editing of, of you know, early embryos, no editing of sperm, no editing of eggs. Um, and that's for a multitude of reasons. I think for many of us, it's part an ethical component. And I think it's also a question of what is the technology ready for? Um, you know, often CRISPR is, is uh, described as kind of the Microsoft word for the genome. You can just go in and make some changes and, you know, boom, you're done. But it's nowhere near as easy as Microsoft Word. Um, and the system is imperfect. You might want to make a change just in this one place, but sometimes other changes happen elsewhere. And so we think it's really important to wrestle with when those what we call off-target effects might be acceptable and when they're not. So if you're thinking about a cancer patient who's very ill, has no further treatment options, their risk tolerance is going to be very different than if you're thinking about a baby who's not even born yet um, and what the risk tolerance should be for that individual. And so that's a big part of what informs our decision. And doesn't that get into also the uh, germline editing, which is something that could affect all of humanity? Exactly. So if, if you just edit a person's T cells or their blood stem cells, those edits stay with them and die with them. They're not passed on to next generations. But the germline, so embryos, eggs, or sperm, those edits not only impact the person born from those materials, but all of their children as well. Uh, and that's, that's a huge implication that has to be thought about appropriately and is a big part of why we don't think it's appropriate. Okay, so there are other people who are working on human embryo editing, specifically in China. We've seen that happen before, and we don't actually know the results of those experiments, right? So uh, what, what, can you explain what's going on with regulation here to make sure that we don't do something completely reckless with the future of humanity? Absolutely. Um, regulation and rules vary dramatically around the world on this topic right now. Um, some of that is because regulations were written decades ago, a long time before any of these technologies existed. And so sometimes they're imperfect for the challenges that we face right now. In the United States, the FDA has made it clear that they will not review any uh, applications for products that rely on editing human embryos or, or human germline materials. So from a therapeutic perspective, that's not going to happen here. Uh, people are doing basic research here in the United States, editing embryos to try to better understand early development, but that's not in the context of then trying to create a pregnancy and, and create a, a person out of it. Um, in other countries, it appears it might be easier to try to do these types of experiments. And, and as you said, allegedly there are uh, multiple edited babies in China, but we, we really don't know a lot about what happened there. It seems like it's a tough call to say to someone who really wants a baby but has a genetic disorder to say, sorry, you're out of luck. What, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. And I've certainly spoken with many people who have themselves rare genetic diseases and would desperately love to ensure that future generations don't. Um, I'm incredibly sympathetic to that. And I think it has to come in the context of knowing that we're not solving one problem 
and creating many, many more, which at this stage we have no confidence in. Okay, let's talk about what people are actually doing in the U.S. right now without much regulation, which is these DIY in your basement or li even live streaming, injecting themselves with CRISPR. Seems like it's it's wild west out there. I mean, what what do you have to say about people who get online and buy a kit and then want to CRISPR themselves? Yeah, I think that's incredibly dangerous. Um, and I, I would break the DIY community into two very different buckets. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are science curious, science enthusiastic. They buy these kits to teach themselves or their friends or their children about science. Um, they're maybe editing bacteria or yeast or something like that. I think that's awesome. I think any chance that people have access to science to better understand it is fabulous. Um, when people instead try to take those materials and self-administer them, and I'm, I'm aware of one case where that has happened in the United States, I think it's terribly irresponsible, um, both for how that, that individual is treating him or her, herself, uh, as well as the potential impact that it has on the community and, and the field. That's not how we do drug development. That's not how we should do drug development. I agree with you, but it does seem like it's sort of open and available for anyone. In fact, there was a, a law recently passed in California that said you can't buy these kits, you can't sell these kits, unless they say not for human use. But I mean, that seems sort of like a band-aid on the problem. Yeah, it's, it's a unique approach. You know, I, I think many stakeholders have different ways to try to approach this and influence it. California took a, a legislative approach Obviously, there's all kinds of regulations that pre-exist for how we're supposed to test and evaluate first safety and later efficacy of new therapies, uh, and, and none of this fits that paradigm. There's a guy here in California, actually, IT consultant, I think it's Malakar Verizak, we were just talking backstage about him, um, who has a rare skin disorder and would like, he's begging scientists to, to CRISPR him to save him from these skin lesions he gets from the sun. Is, do you think he should be allowed to CRISPR himself? Yeah, it's, it's a really tough case. So I, I've read probably the same news article that you have about this. Um, and I, I think it's a great example of some of the misconceptions of where the CRISPR technology is today. Um, you know, maybe going back to the Microsoft Word uh, analogy, we don't have all the tools in the toolbox for all the changes we might want to make. Um, in fact, we're, we're pretty good at deleting things and only just learning as a field how to do a good job of inserting new genes. But it all relies on having a really sophisticated understanding of what's wrong in a given genome and how to correct it. Um, and my understanding is he has some, some pretty out-of-the-box ideas for how to take a gene from a, a very different species, a, a little tardigrade, um, to put in his own genome to try to impact his biology. Again, I think that's completely outside the context of, of how we do drug development um, and, and doesn't seem like a, a safe or fair approach for him. Absolutely. Yeah, I can see that. Um, what's the worst case scenario? Like, scare the audience a little bit. What's the worst thing that can happen with CRISPR? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I was in Hong Kong last year for the meeting where the announcement came out that allegedly multiple babies had been edited with CRISPR. And I think that already was what many people would have thought of as the worst case outcome. Um, you know, I, I think people are, are very concerned, I'm very concerned that uh, misuse of the technology will hurt someone um, and will also slow down its application in places where people are following the rules and there is tremendous potential and people are working inside of the, the regulated environment that we have here in the United States to test new therapies that could impact a huge number of patients positively. And so I, I really worry about, about both sides of that. Yeah, and, and from my understanding, people could also make biological weapons. There's a lot of other directions they could go with CRISPR right now that we mainly need better regulation on? I think that gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you were trying to be devious and develop biological weapons, there are probably a lot of other technologies you'd, you'd go to first. Um, CRISPR really works kind of one cell at a time, one organism at a time. It's, it's not a great way to 
attack a lot of things simultaneously. Um, I don't think that takes away, though, from the importance of really thinking about the seriousness of both the potential and the consequences and the ethical implications. Okay, that's fair. Um, okay, so, uh, but CRISPR also, you were saying, isn't exactly 100%, 100% of the time. We have a long ways to go. Uh, should we be worried about that since we're doing human DNA editing right now? Yeah, so I, I think that's a big part of why we believe it's acceptable at this stage to work on developing cancer therapies or, or therapies for other patients who have no other options. Um, and the field is doing a lot of work, our team is doing a lot of work on trying to improve the specificity of the technology and improve our ability to measure it. Um, and we actually even have a, a consortium of, of many of the companies and some of the academics who are leaders in this field who are all working together in a pre-competitive way, um, led by NIST, actually, to help us develop standards as an industry to solve some of these problems. Where are you at in the process right now? Are you actually doing clinical trials with humans right now, or where are you at? Soon. Um, so we're still in preclinical research, and we expect to be in our first phase one trial next year. Next year. And do you know how many people you'll be, you'll be using, or not using, that's not the right word, but bringing in to the trial? That's, that's a great question. Typically, these trials are, are pretty small, and it's maybe 20 to 30 patients who would be part of a phase one trial. Okay. Um, how do you handle not knowing the consequences for he editing human DNA maybe 300 years from now? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think that we try to inform and influence what can be done, what should be done, and what can't be done today. You know, as, as a small company with not a lot of resources, we don't often have the opportunity to think 300 or 500 years from now. Um, you know, when my board of directors asks me about three or five years from now, I think that's an eternity. But I do think we have an opportunity as, as scientists in this community to be part of some of these larger conversations about the role that these therapies can play. And I think in far fewer than 300 years, we're going to have an entire new wave of medicines that are really genetically based, whether they're gene therapies or cell therapies, using gene editing, we'll be able to treat disease in a much more defined and genetic way than we have thus far. And I think that's incredibly cool. Okay, what are we, uh, last question, what are we looking at maybe in the near future, like you mentioned, three to five years out, what are we looking at in the near future? Yeah, I think we are looking at uh, clinical data. So there are already multiple clinical trials happening in the United States and elsewhere testing CRISPR in either the, ca the cancer context or genetic diseases. And over the next three to five years, we're going to start to see a lot of evidence for how and if that's working, and maybe even the first drug approval in that time. All right. Well, thank you so much for getting on stage with us and talking us through CRISPR. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks.